Welcome back everybody. We have another response video for you here. I'm going to be stepping a little bit outside my wheelhouse. I only say a little bit. This is going to be more of a philosophical video about the existence of God or perhaps the nature of God. We'll get into it. But yeah, I only say a little bit outside my wheelhouse though. I'm focused on psychology now. Philosophy was my major in undergrad. Sorry mom and dad. And here we have a video from PragerU. It's not a university, but they've made a name for themselves by looking really smart in front of modern-day leftists, which is pretty easy to do now. This is the Ben Shapiro way of appearing intelligent. Simply debate Sally Cohn, and you're going to probably look pretty intelligent. So when PragerU stops debating leftists on topics like diversity and intersectionality, then they begin to look a little bit stupid. And that's what they do here in this video. They are going to reiterate an argument from design, which is as old as ancient Greece. This goes back to before Plato, before Socrates, back to Anaxagoras. This is the argument from design for the existence of God. <laughs> and they're not even going to do that great of a job arguing for it. But we're going to look at the philosophical errors in it. We're going to look at the errors in this video and how this does relate back to more my wheelhouse, something that's going on with psychology right now. In fact, perhaps the best arguments for his existence come from, of all places, science itself. Here's the story. The same year Time featured its now famous headline, the astronomer Carl Sagan announced that there were two necessary criteria for a planet to support life the right kind of star, and a planet the right distance from that star. Given the roughly octillion planets in the universe, that's one followed by 24 zeros, there should have been about septillion planets, that's one followed by 21 zeros, capable of supporting life. With such spectacular odds, scientists were optimistic that the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, known by its initials SETI, an ambitious project launched in the 1960s, was sure to turn up something soon. With a vast radio telescopic network, scientists listened for signals that resembled coded intelligence. But as the years passed, the silence from the universe was deafening. As of 2014, researchers have discovered precisely bubkis, not a zilch, which is to say zero followed by an infinite number of zeros. By the way, before we get into it, this has been the nature of the relationship between science and religion ever since the inception of science some 500, 600 years ago. I mean, in the modern context in which we know it. Religion already has the answers. According to them, they already have the answers. And science says, okay, but what about this? What about this thing over here? Let's investigate this area further. And the religionists sit back with their arms crossed and go, no, nope, this isn't going to work out. And then when there's a little bit of a hiccup, doesn't work out exactly the way we want. We may have to change the calculations around religion as always sit back, arms crossed, face smug, and go, see, we told you. What does this sound like? That's right. This sounds like your loser brother-in-law who always criticizes everything you do. You have a cool idea, and he's like, oh, that's not going to work because of this and that. It's that character in Jerry Maguire. Sorry, this movie's from 25 years ago, but it just popped in my head. This character is from Jerry Maguire, his cousin, Rod Tidwell, his cousin, Cuba Gooding Jr., his character's cousin in the movie, sitting back, criticizing, and saying, see, I told you he was too small for the NFL. That's religion. So even before we get into any of the, quote, facts that they're going to present here, you don't want to hang out with this guy. Continuing. What happened? As our knowledge of the universe increased, it became clear that there were, in fact, far more factors necessary for life, let alone intelligent life, than Sagan supposed. His two parameters grew to 10, then 20, and then 50, which meant that the number of potentially life-supporting planets decreased accordingly. The number dropped to a few thousand planets and kept on plummeting. Even SETI proponents acknowledged the problem. Peter Schenkel wrote in a 2006 piece for Skeptical Inquirer, a magazine that strongly affirms atheism, in light of new findings and insights, we should quietly admit that the early estimates may no longer be tenable. Yeah, that's a good thing. 
in the pursuit of knowledge, you're going to change your stance. Put forth a hypothesis, do some research, think about some more, and then change it around a little. That's how this works. That's how the pursuit of knowledge works. That's a strong position to be in epistemologically. To say, well, I thought this, but given new evidence, now I may think this or now I d- doubt this thing that I originally thought. It's in a sense an apology, an epistemological apology. And what this Eric Metaxas guy is doing in effect is throwing the apology back in his face. You ever do that with somebody? You did something wrong and go to apologize for them and then they bring up other things. It's like they pile on top of you. Yeah, you don't want to hang out with that guy. <laughs> He's not your friend. He doesn't really have your best interest at heart. Continuing. Today, there are more than 200 known parameters necessary for a planet to support life, every single one of which must be perfectly met or the whole thing falls apart. For example, without a massive, gravity-rich planet like Jupiter nearby to draw away asteroids, Earth would be more like an interstellar dartboard than the verdant orb that it is. Simply put, the odds against life in the universe are astonishing. Yet, here we are, not only existing, but talking about existing. What can account for it? Okay, here it comes. I know a lot of build up, but here's the argument from design. Go. Can every one of those many parameters have been perfectly met by accident? At what point is it fair to admit that it is science itself that suggests that we cannot be the result of random forces? Doesn't assuming that an intelligence created these perfect conditions in fact require far less faith than believing that a life-sustaining Earth just happened to beat the inconceivable odds? Do you guys see the mistake here? Do you see the fundamental logical fallacy that this guy's making? What is it? That's right. Exactly. This isn't random. The universe is not here by a bunch of random forces. That's the fallacy. This assumes, the argument from design assumes, and it has assumed for the last 2,500 years since it's been uh, being used, first by Anaxagoras and then later brought to light by Aquinas. This assumes that existence left to its own devices is chaos which fails to recognize a corollary of cause and effect, which is part of existence. It's a corollary of identity. A thing is that it is. This goes back to Aristotle. It is not chaos, though. Simply the fact that cause and effect exist implies order. To put it another way, the law of identity says that every entity has a certain nature. It has an identity. It has a way of being in the world. So because of that, it's going to interact with other things that also have their identities, their natures that are of a certain way. So the results of these two things interacting are going to be predictable. It's going to create a universe in which Different entities are not interacting chaotically, but rather interacting in an orderly fashion. Yes, the argument of design seems like it makes a lot of sense when you don't understand what science is, and then you invoke this idea of a supernatural God into the argument, which commits the fallacy of begging the question, i.e. circular reasoning, where did God come from? Where did this cosmic mind come from? You can't answer that question. You just simply say that is so it doesn't really answer the question of why we live in this orderly universe. However, if you just look at the entities in the universe, understand that they have a nature and that they are going to interact with each other in a specific way, then the result of that will be orderly. So then what happens? Beings that evolve in this universe that has laws of a certain way, they are going to be built, you could say, for this universe. Similarly, religionists will say, oh, the the sun, you know, it's a perfect distance from the earth. It's a perfect distance for humans to survive and other animals and plants to survive. It just happened to be the perfect distance. No, animals and plants and humans, we evolved on this planet to be of a specific nature, to be of a certain nature, the nature of beings that would exist best on a planet that was 93 million miles away from a star of a certain size. And what's the deeper fallacy here? And how does this relate to psychology? That's right, the reversal of cause and effect. 
existence isn't orderly because of some outside force pressing upon it, like the demiurge in the Timaeus uh, platonic dialogue. It is orderly because of the nature of the entities interacting. And of course, this is what CBT gets wrong, cognitive behavioral therapy. Oh, you're happy because you have help, happy thoughts. So we're going to force you to, to tr- change your thoughts to be happy and then you're going to be happy. No, you're happy because you have a well-regulated limbic system. And that makes it more likely for you to have happy thoughts. But that's just the, re- the result. That's just the effect. You can't change the effect and expect to change the cause. But wait, there's more. The fine-tuning necessary for life to exist on a planet is nothing compared with the fine-tuning required for the universe to exist at all. For example, astrophysicists now know that the values of the four fundamental forces, gravity, the electromagnetic force, and the strong and weak nuclear forces, were determined less than one millionth of a second after the Big Bang. Alter any one of these four values ever so slightly, and the universe as we know it could not exist. For instance, if the ratio between the strong nuclear force and the electromagnetic force had been off by the tiniest fraction of the tiniest inconceivable fraction, then no stars could have formed at all. Okay, now he's just saying the same thing over again in a different context. Let's skip ahead and see what else he has to say. Fred Hoyle, the astronomer who coined the term Big Bang, said that his atheism was greatly shaken by these developments. One of the world's most renowned theoretical physicists, Paul Davies, has said that the appearance of design is overwhelming. Even the late Christopher Hitchens, one of atheism's most aggressive proponents, conceded that without question the fine-tuning argument was the most powerful argument of the other side. Oxford University professor of mathematics, Dr. John Lennox, has said, the more we get to know about our universe, the more the hypothesis that there is a creator gains in credibility as the best explanation of why we are here. But it's not an explanation because it doesn't explain anything because if you put everything back on a creator, to reiterate, if you put everything back on a creator like he caused everything and he created this relationship, this fine-tuned relationship between these different forces, then you have to explain where he comes from. It doesn't explain anything. This isn't science. You can know a lot about science, but not know what science is. That's the error. And maybe it was stupid for me to major in in philosophy in college. But at least I'm not watching this video going, maybe, maybe God created everything. It was all worth it. All the unemployment, it was all worth it (laughs) if it meant watching this video and not being lured by the ridiculousness, by the seemingly logical nature of this video, but at the root, the ridiculousness of the argument. And I'll say something else here. I do think God is an important concept. It is an important concept psychologically, not philosophically. Philosophically, it's unimportant to to the extent it doesn't even matter philosophically, but psychologically, it is important. Which maybe is a little bit more complicated of an issue uh, to to go into now, but but I think by trying to explain, come up with some rational argument for God, philosophical, scientific, whatever, some kind of rational argument for God doesn't get at the root of what God is and why he is ultimately, why it is an ultimately important concept. Maybe I'll go into this more in another video, but I'll leave it there for you for now to figure out why that is.